welcome to Unibet's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden with former UFC title challenger and current analyst Dan the Outlaw Hardy. UFC 187 has already hit the headlines. John Jones has been stripped of his title and the vacant light heavyweight belt will now be contested between Anthony Rumble Johnson and Daniel Cormier. Plus, furthermore, we have another championship bout to assess as the middleweight division sees the champion Chris Weidman face Vitor Belfort. So, Dan will cast his expert eye over these two tantalising bouts. Oh my goodness! Rumble is a machine right now! Daniel Cormier, ladies and gentlemen! That man's ready for another shot at the title! Chris Weidman knocked Anderson Silva out cold! Vitor Belfour has finished 10 opponents in the first round. He is a monster. And the UFC returns to Las Vegas to bring you UFC 187. And Dan, that is a fully loaded card front to back. It's a dream card for any, any fan, to be honest. Aside from the main and co-main event, you've got three fights there, and every one of those fights is in the top ten, other than John McDessie, who's stepping in at short notice. I mean, there's a lot of rankings going to be changing after this event. Absolutely. So let's take a look at the main event then. We see Daniel Cormier making his second attempt at that light heavyweight title. A former two-time Olympian, former heavyweight strike force Grand Prix champion, taking on Anthony Johnson, who really exceeded expectations against Gustafsson, dispatching him in the first round. And he is running a nine-fight win streak. They're both amazing athletes. Both have got different things to offer. Obviously, Anthony Johnson's power and Daniel Cormier's tenacity and, uh, and conditioning. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with Anthony Johnson. I want to tell you a few things okay. that I've noticed about the way he stands, which is quite interesting. And, and I think this is partly because uh, of his power and, and his ability to, to basically create a wall for his opponents to run into. Watch this little sidestep he does every now and then to, to get out the way of his opponent. Now, he stands quite square. And this is something that you wouldn't generally do. Obviously, it opens you up for takedowns and stuff. But as you can see, every Every time an opponent shoots in on him or steps in to strike, it allows him to just dip to one side and then dip to the other. And when they shoot, he meets them with square hips, which really helps with his takedown defense, which caused Phil Davis all kinds of problems in this fight. But just watch how he moves on his feet. He's quite steady, he's quite stable and quite rooted when he's landing his punches, but then as soon as his opponent attacks, immediately he's good at getting his hips away. Moves back, gets his feet out of the way, and these little dips to the side, these little slips that he uses, really exposes his opponent. He catches Phil Davis a few, look at that, a beautiful little yeah. slip to the side, and then capitalizes by just basically running him down. It's unusual because most people can't get away with standing like this. If most people would stand square, they'd get bull rushed over. With Anthony Johnson being such a strong, powerful athlete, he can get away with it. OK, well, like normal, we are going to go to the world of Twitter for a question. And our first one is from Oni Lakelli. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong, Oni. If the fight goes to the fourth and fifth rounds, do you think DC takes the belt? I definitely think he has an advantage. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that he's going to win a decision. Obviously, Anthony Johnson can hit him with some big shots in those earlier rounds, get some 10-8 rounds under his belt possibly even you know, even a 10-7 round with the power that Anthony Johnson has. Okay. And Daniel Cormier has to put himself in harm's way in order to get his hands on Johnson. So he has to go through that striking range, which is going to be very, very dangerous for him. If he does get through those first couple of rounds and if he does manage to capitalise and wear Anthony Johnson down a bit, that's when his conditioning comes into play. And, and the one thing that we see with these wrestlers when they cross over to mixed martial arts is they keep that same wrestling mentality. We spoke about it on previous breakdowns as well. And no one really embodies it better than Daniel Cormier. Keeping a hold of you, dragging you down to the floor and just being heavy on you, weighing on you. And finding opportunities in the clinch to throw strikes as well. Obviously against Dan Henderson, he went back to his bread and butter, his ground game, his wrestling. And look at the pressure that he puts on him. Now, no one does this to Dan Henderson. No. Dan Henderson was an Olympian himself. So this is Daniel Cormier at his best. Holding the guy down, wearing on them, catching them with clean shots. And watch this, lifts him over his head, slams him on the floor. These little things here, these little trips and sweeps, the things that he uses in the fight that often go unnoticed by a lot of people, they're the things that are going to make the difference. They're the things that are going to make Anthony Johnson tired, cautious, fatigued, hesitant, and Daniel Cormier is going to stay relaxed and just keep working. And that's where his conditioning comes in, because he doesn't get tense. And also, he's training with the guys at AKA. You have Cain Velasquez, Velasquez and Luke Rockhold yeah. as your main training partners. 
And what that's allowed him to do is really create a, a style of striking which allows him to bring that, that wrestling base out in, in such a beautiful way, and he's obviously very effective with it. Yeah, most definitely. He's very good at swarming. He throws nice, tight, looping punches and then pushes people to the floor. It, it, it's, he's going to have to put an Anthony Johnson under a lot of pressure if he's going to do anything in those first couple of rounds. But obviously, like I said, the danger is the Johnson Powers stepping into that, that range and taking those risks. Here he is swarming Roy Nelson, pushing him onto the back foot. Very good with the kicks as well. Something else that... that Very flexible. Yeah. Something that goes unnoticed, something that you wouldn't necessarily think if you looked at Daniel Cormier. Ultimately, Cormier needs to get his hands on him. I mean, he struggled against John Jones, but he did good things in the first couple of rounds. Getting a hand on the back of his neck, getting a single arm tie, tying him up, hitting him with short shots, and chopping away at his legs as well. If he can crowd Anthony Johnson, he's going to stand a better chance, because that doesn't give Anthony Johnson that range to really wind up and land those big punches that will put him to sleep. And he's facing Anthony Johnson, the finishing machine, the lion's share of his career in the UFC yeah. and outside has been knockout and TKO finishes. Working with Henry Hooft as well now, I think they've really tuned into one another and, and he's just, he's so dangerous. Mm. Uh, with an athlete that, that, like that, you only need a, a coach that can tidy them up a little bit. Oftentimes you'll get an athlete as raw and explosive and as powerful as Anthony Johnson and when they start working with a the coach they try and reprogram them so they can't function in, in the ways that are physiologically natural to them. Now Anthony Johnson here, look how he measures with one hand. Very Crocop. Crocop does this a lot. He puts one hand on his opponent and hits and uses the same hand to hit over and over again. He does it the same with, uh, with Gustafsson here, look, measuring with one hand. Keep one hand on him, keep cracking him with the other. That's the hand that Daniel Cormier's got to get past. Daniel Cormier has to close that distance and get around that arm, get underneath it and get his hands on Anthony Johnson's body. Otherwise, Anthony Johnson can measure him, keep him at a distance and pick those shots. And if he lands one shot that hurts and he knows that you're hurt, he will keep pouring it on. We saw it in the Nagira fight, we saw it here against Gustafsson. He knows when to pull the pressure on and he knows that he can't, you know, give it everything he's got in the first round if he yeah. catches a shot, especially with a guy like Cormier because his conditioning will last 25 minutes. So Johnson's going to have to be a bit more measured. OK, so let's take a look at the fight metrics for this matchup then. And I think this really does tell a story of a striker versus a grappler, certainly in the, the areas that they excel. Definitely. Look at Anthony Johnson's takedown defence, 85%. I think he stuffed seven of seven of Phil Davis's takedowns. And that is going to be key for this fight, because if he ends up on the floor with Daniel Cormier on top, he may only need one takedown to put him there, and then he'll just smother him and keep him there. And that's just energy that Anthony Johnson is wasting that he could be putting into his punches. OK, well, we're going to bring in something that's maybe not quite appropriate for this sequence of analysis, Dan. Uh, we've seen Anthony Johnson in the past being absolutely <laughs> fantastic, just a, a demolition sometimes and faultless performances. And you've, you've been quite close to some of this action in the past, Dan. So if we can just roll this and I this was coming. and just give some <laughs> thoughts on, on this, please, Dan. Just smothering. Just, he was, he's just a big monster. I mean, I, I couldn't do anything with him. Um, yeah. This is at 170, <laughs> by the way. He's now obviously a, a championship contender at 205. This is some, unbelievable. He smells good, though. He had a lovely smell of cocoa butter. I'll tell you what, I didn't have dry skin for a month after that fight. <laughs> yeah, it was a tough night. Was oh, a long dear. One. You're a good sport, Mr Hardy. OK, so can DC grab this unexpected opportunity immediately after his last attempt to claim the belt? Or will the resurgent Anthony Rumble Johnson, a former welterweight, make this a fairy tale ending? Who do you favour for victory and what way do you see the fight finishing? As always, there are odds to be found on every round and it's brought to you by Unibet. Watch and bet live with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. So on to our co-main and we will see Vita Belfort, the former light heavyweight champion, making his 20th octagon appearance against defending champion Chris Weidman. And Dan, Chris Weidman has a proven, unbeatable thus far formula for success. He does, and it's that wrestling mentality again. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Let, let's get into the video and, and let me talk you through this little bit of footwork that I, I think is very important, though. Now, watch when Anderson Silva steps to his left. This is something Vitor Belfort does a lot. He likes to circle to his left because it sets up that angle from his left hand. Chris Weidman doing a great job of cutting off the octagon, which forces Anderson Silva to go back the opposite way. OK. We need to see him doing that against Vitor Belfort. And there's a good reason for it, because Vitor Belfort, unlike most other people, 
always circles to his left, when usually as a southpaw you will circle to your right towards your, your opponent's lead hand. And if Chris Weidman can circle him away from his power hand, can force him to move towards his right, it's going to open up a lot of things for Chris Weidman. Look at this. This is fifth round against Lyoto Machida. Yeah. The later rounds is really where Weidman needs to get to Vitor Belfort too. And catching this far leg when he shoots is another thing that's very important. To set that up correctly, he has to get Vitor Belfort circling in the correct direction. OK. So on to Twitter, Dan. And thank you to Bobby. You sent a few questions over, so thank you for those. Will Weidman have to work on his footwork for the bout against Belfort? Yeah, great question. That's exactly what we've just been talking about. Um, well, let me talk you through it like this. So if you stand southpaw for me, you can play Vitor oh. Belfort for a second. Ooh. Don't be too quick, though. <laughs> so we're in this position here. Now, most of the time, a southpaw will be circling to try and stay on the outside of my lead leg because then that's going to set up this straight left here. Yeah. Vitor does the opposite thing, which is very unusual. Can't argue with it because it works, but he circles to his left. So, and what, and what he does is, as you're circling that way, that direction, it forces me to open up in, in this way here. Because Vitor's so quick, he can get away with that straight left, straight down the pipe, as I'm turning to face. So in order for Weidman to prevent that, he has to constantly circle this way and force Vitor to move in the, in the direction that's not comfortable for him. That will open up the lead left and the single leg for him. Okay. If he doesn't, then he's going to have to contend with that speed of Vitor Belfort and that blitz. And that's what we've seen do him doing throughout this... Well, let's have a look. Throughout his whole career. Vitor is wearing shoes, so he will not be able oh. to strike with the feet. Oh, he does with the hands up! Vitor Belfort! I mean, just look at that speed. This, this is, is, it's, 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 it is It's beautiful. It's just, I mean, the, the speed that Vitor Belfort uh, used to have as a early 20s, he's still got in, in his late 30s. He's still a very, very quick, very powerful athlete. And he's very good at measuring his opponents, measuring the distance and staying in just the right range to land a kick or a punch right on the end of the technique. So it is at its most powerful. Watch this against Dan Henderson. Short left hand, pop. And as you, you'll see, he was circling to his left as he did it. As he stepped, he threw the straight left. And signature Vitor Belfort, when he knows you're hurt, he's not going to give you a second to breathe. And because he hits so quickly, something's going to land and something's yeah. going to land with power. This is him against the Bisping, circling to his left. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. This is unusual. Most southpaws won't move in this direction. And um, that's probably because they can't get away with it because they're not as quick as Belfort. And like I said, when he sees you hurt, he'll just pour on the pressure. Seems quite reckless, but again, with the speed and with the power that he has, he gets away with it. Again, he was circling to his left for the left head kick. It just seems to be something that's, that, that Vito Belfort has mastered. It's comfortable for him. I noticed it when I was sparring with him. He caught me with some wicked shots circling towards his left. So in order for Weidman to prevent that, he's got to crowd that area for him and force him in the opposite direction. So Chris Weidman, and talk about crowding and his offence, if you like. I mean, very much like what Daniel Cormier needs yeah. to do. And he's got a great team down with Sarah Longo and, and John Danaher. And he's yeah. very aggressive, but they've really got this for which I, what I said at the top they have a great formula for success with him they do and they know how to speak to speak his language which is one thing that is the most important when you've got a corner team they don't necessarily have to be the most knowledgeable but if they know how to communicate with you between rounds when you've got that and it's not even 60 seconds because you know you take away the to walk and to out. and from yeah 45 seconds at the most they have a few well let's let's get it on now so let's have a quick look at his corner team behind him I want you to punch a hole in this chest that's what I want so that's his striking coach, Ray Longo, giving him some very concise advice in the, <laughs> in, at the end of the round. And then immediately he comes out and, and knocks out Anderson Silva, you know, arguably the greatest fighter of all time. Yeah. So it's working. They're speaking his language. They're telling him exactly what he needs to know, bullet points, and it's working when it comes Expletives. to fight time. <laughs> there you go. I think that's a part of it, though. He likes the cussing. Yeah, it sure. makes him feel more at home. So, uh, and as you can see here, he's starting to mix it up. Against Leoto Machida, he's throwing kicks, he's throwing elbows and knees. And then you've got this elbow against uh, Mark Munoz, which, in my opinion, is the best elbow that's ever been landed in, in the octagon. It was perfectly timed, and you just don't see people intercepting with an elbow like that, which obviously shows that he's experimental with his striking, he's confident with his striking, and he's going to need it in this fight because Vitor Belfort is one of, the, one of the most dangerous strikers in the world. Yeah, and timing on elbows needs to be absolutely perfect. <laughs> So, Vitor Belfort is just so very experienced. He's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He's a Judo black belt as well. Sometimes not 
things that come to mind when describing Belfort, but he's going to have to pull on all of those different aspects against Weidman. He is, and it's worth noting as well, I think he's been a black belt for like 16 years or something, and it's not just any black belt, he got it from Carlson Gracie. Yeah, it's legitimate. So yeah, we, we, know, we know that he's got some skills, and he's been around for so long, that's a lot of mat time. He travels around, he trains with a lot of different guys, and look at the timing on that. He's Perfect. very good at getting, getting his uh, legs and his hips away, smashing his opponent to the canvas with a real powerful sprawl, and then capitalising if there's a mistake that they've made. It, it, it's something that Chris Weidman's got to really watch out for. And something else as well, underestimated by Vito Belfort, is, is his ground game, is his submission skills. Just as Joe Rogan was saying, we've never seen Vito throw anything off his back before, and he almost armbars John Jones. Oh, <laughs> so the commentator's curse. <laughs> of course, of course. And again, here against Anthony Johnson, a big, powerful, strong wrestler, really, really intent on getting this takedown. And Vito Belfort manages to just forklift him back up. Now watch this. Stuff in the head, I'm gonna pause this for a second. Stuff in the head. This is the hand that he needs to be watching out for. Because if Weidman gets that on his far leg, he'll be able to pull that in and put him on his back. So what he needs to be doing is this, watch this. So he stuffs the head, sprawls out, and then he starts to peel his hand off. Okay. I need to be seeing a lot of this because if he can keep Weidman extended, he's always gonna have an advantage in the takedown defense. And if he can take the back, obviously we know he's got submission skills. So Weidman can't be relaxed, he can't be, can't be too lackadaisical on the floor. If he's going to take him there, he's got to be uh, sure of what he's going to do and he's got to always be in a strong position because Vitor's got skills for days, he's been doing this for his whole life, so you can't count him out anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, let's see if there any of the factual data can shed any more light onto this then. So take a look at what we see here. And once again, it's, it's that striker versus grappler, the finisher versus, you know, the, the very explosive wrestler. It is, but look, look at the first two stats. For Vitor Belfort, most knockouts in UFC history. In UFC history, that's everybody that stepped inside the octagon, that's massive. And then uh, Chris Weidman, never been outstruck. So that's work rate against power for me. Chris Weidman, and, and, and never been outstruck, he's probably never been out wrestled either. No one's been able to put Weidman pressure on Weidman like he does to other people. So he needs to do that to Vitor Belfort and just stay out of, out of the way, stay out of danger because Vitor Belfort can change the fight in a second. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. Enjoyed that. So Weidman versus Belfort has been a long time in the making and the challenger has it all to do. But can he upset the odds in the champion's third middleweight defence? Who is your pick to win and how do you see the fight finishing? As always, there are odds to be found on every round and it's all brought to you by Unibet. Watch and bet live with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. OK, so that's the two at the top, but Dan, there is plenty more to look forward to on this card. There are so many good fights, really exciting. We've got Cowboy Cerrone again taking another fight. Everyone loves Cowboy. You know what you're going to get with Cowboy. It's going to be an exciting fight. He's going to bring Muay Thai, he's going to bring submissions, he's going to bring pressure. And he's stepping in against John McDessie, who's actually replacing uh, uh, Habib Namagomedov. This is a great opportunity for McDessie to take somebody out in the top 10 and to really push his way into a really stacked uh, lightweight division. If he can beat Donald Cerrone, that can change his career right now. Happer, Travis Brown, excited for this one. Big six foot eight heavyweight on a roll at the moment. He's a real dangerous guy in this division. Uh, eight first round wins since he joined the UFC. And he's just got power in everything that he throws. Obviously working with Ricky Lundell as well, so his wrestling's coming on. And we may see him use that against Andrei Olovsky, who's coming off a big win over Bigfoot. A knockout, a beautiful knockout back in the UFC wants to show what he's made of, and if he can beat Travis Brown, that's another huge win on his record. We've got uh, Joe Benavidez, one of the Team Alpha male guys, very exciting, unorthodox with his submissions, likes a good guillotine, very, very chaotic with his striking, very fast, taking on John Moraga, who would be more than happy to stand and trade with him. John Moraga fighting out of the MMA lab, another training uh, partner of uh, Ben Henderson, can finish the fight wherever it goes, and again, it's just sitting outside of the top five now, so if he can get a win over Benavidez, there's an argument for another title shot there. Great stuff. UFC 187 cannot wait. So, some dates for the diary, or file of facts if you prefer. On May the 30th in Goiânia, Brazil, Carlos Condit faces Thiago Alves. On the 6th of June in New Orleans, Tim Bosch and Dan Henderson clash. And on the 13th, UFC 188 sees heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez enjoy home advantage in Mexico City against the interim champion Fabricio Verdun. 
Remember, you can get all the pre-fight odds with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. Lots to look forward to then, and please keep those tweets coming in at Unibet using the hashtag InsideTheOctagon with any questions regarding those fights for Dan and I to ponder. Enjoy the fighting feast that is UFC 187. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.